Welcome to the Better Business, Better Life show. I'm your podcast host, Deborah Chantry-Taylor. In this podcast, I interview business owners, EOS implementers, and business experts who share with you their experiences, tips, and tools to help you create not only a better business, but also a better life. At the end of each show, you will have three tips or tools that our guests share that you can implement immediately into your life. If you want more information or want to get in contact, you can visit my website, debra.coach. That's D-E-B-R-A dot coach. Please enjoy the show. And today I'm joined by Simon Carstens, who's a sales performance expert. Is that right, Simon? Yes, that's right. Excellent. Yeah, I'm well, looking forward to hearing more about that. Yeah. So Simon and I actually met through a networking um, community group that I'm part of called Connected Communities. Um, and um, I guess we've got to know each other over the time. And I thought I'd love to hear some of the things that Simon has to say on the podcast. I'm sure you'll get huge value from it too. So Simon, welcome to the studio. Thanks very much. Um, love to hear your story of how you got to be a sales performance expert. Great. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it goes way back to the 19th. 90s actually I was at university studying a business degree and okay. during one of the school holidays or the um, the breaks I looked on the student job search board and there was a, a role offering commission only sales roles and I thought I'll give that a go it sounds really interesting so it's pretty went, brave commission it, only <laughs> it was. Yeah, I sort yeah. of backed myself and and it was probably for a bit of um, experience as well as as money mm -hmm. and so I bought myself my first briefcase turned up to this new job and they gave me yellow pages and said go for it <laughs> <laughs> that was <laughs> it literally was like that told me about the product and, yeah. and there was a guy at the time who, who talked me through the the sale process but it was incredibly difficult actually going through the yellow pages looking for businesses finding the right person booking meetings turning up presenting dealing with objections and closing and it was very difficult to this day I think it's probably the most difficult job I've ever had yeah. but I really loved it and I and I, I thrived on the excitement so I decided that's what I wanted to do for a career ah so did that mean you finished the degree though I did yes. okay yep because <laughs> I must admit I, I switched sort of midway through a degree and kind of went this is not what I want to do and went off to do something else yeah, yeah. so a lot of people don't really know what they want to do until yeah. you know they come out of their degree but I knew at that point so I got my first sales job mm -hmm. um, and I got a couple of sales jobs after that which were very similar actually having to go out there and find business and and close and I love the thrill of the chase yep to do with that um so I, I earned my stripes in New Zealand at the end of the 1990s I did my OE went to London Mm -hmm. and where I worked for a number of uh, telecommunications companies. Okay. So that was fantastic training for me. I'd worked yeah. for Telecom New Zealand before I left, and with that experience was able to work for a couple of t telcos. My first one was WorldCom. Oh, yeah. During the good, I, yeah, good times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I went through the good times and the bad with them. It was great starting with them. They gave me a lot of formal sales training. Uh, it was it was a pretty disciplined and, and high performing sales environment. Mm -hmm. You know, you could uh, be really successful and earn great money if you succeeded, but you you'd probably be walked out the door if you didn't. <laughs> yep. So a lot of pressure, a um, lot of rewards, and a lot of success financially and otherwise. Mm -hmm. So that was great. Um, went through the great times with them, and then they became bankrupt. You probably heard the story. Oh, yeah. And so the economy was starting to suffer at that point, and um, so the economy started declining. Uh, they went bankrupt. <laughs> so I saw the boom and the bust, and it was yep. really interesting working for companies in those two modes. Yeah, which is very growth, different modes. Growth yeah. modes, everything's great. Going on trips, mm -hmm. um, a lot of enjoyment. Made some great friends through those times of austerity. We're paying for our mobiles. We were told we're grateful to have a job. Yep. You just knuckled down and you got on with it. Mm -hmm. And then I got my first leadership role, yeah. working for a company called Global Crossing at the time, which was a company coming out of bankruptcy. So I had the opportunity to build teams. It was my first leadership role. So I had to learn how to uh, lead through others as opposed to carrying the bag and, and um, selling myself, which was my first big leadership challenge. Fantastic. So that was great um, for me. I, I studied, um, did my MBA concurrently. So yep. I was working and studying at the same time. I've done that. It's hard, isn't yeah, it? It's very, it's very difficult. <laughs> yeah. every, every minute counts. You know, you're yep. quite accountable. But I had the opportunity to build teams, um, in particular this, this team, build a European sales team, mm -hmm. pick people, work out what I need in terms of capabilities, where we were trying to get to strategically uh, with a company and, and build some quite high performing teams there uh, moved into a corporate part of the same organization and did the same it was a lot more cutthroat a lot of hiring a lot of firing a lot of pressure you know turning up to to work in the morning with a knot in your stomach wondering what's going to happen today and <laughs> yep. who's going to get fired and uh, it was pretty it was pretty grueling but i think it taught me the basics you know in terms of what real selling is like in that right. hard environment yep um, i was able to hone my craft and, and be quite successful at it so that was this that was my uk experience if you like developing mm -hmm. the skills Came back to New Zealand around 2009, 
and worked for a couple of telcos here in yeah. sales leadership roles. So very much um, same story. This uh, Spark at Telecom at the time was was um, suffering from intense competition. So yep. that was very that environment where you had to get your team up to speed and learn how to compete in an environment where they never had competition before. Mm -hmm. And then I worked for uh, an IT company for a while where I was selling mm. again, as uh, leading a sales team. Hardware, software or both? Uh, it was outsourced services. Okay. So everything, so everything IT select. that an organization has, whether it be service databases. Yep. And then I got my first exec role uh, working for a company at the time called Paymark, which is now called Wordline. Oh, yep. Yep. Um, so that was another great opportunity of completely transforming the sales team uh, from where they were to where the company was heading, which mm -hmm. was to build um, world leading uh, products and services, where it was a, pretty much an incumbent before they didn't have anything to sell. So another opportunity for, for me to work out the capability we need, the culture we need and develop a team and and build into high performance. So that's what I've done all my career and that's what I love the most. And, and, my and most then you left it, didn't you? And I went did. to work for yourself. I did, yeah. Look, yeah get your own company. <laughs> it was really interesting. So so how that all happened, it was it was a collision of a number of, of things. Yep. I uh, my last job was for a very large corporation and was a huge team, about 150 people. Mm -hmm. It was the first role I've had that it was it was incredibly difficult on on many levels. Mm. Culturally, um, it was very hard to be successful and I just didn't enjoy it. Mm. So I was forced to question my own ability the company I was working for, the culture, and decided what I really wanted to do. Yep. Plus a few personal challenges I had. So it was a chance for me to take a step back. I did a lot of work working through my purpose, what I really loved about the roles, what I loved about uh, what I do, mm -hmm. what I'm passionate about, and what I'm great at. And that with those three, three things, I decided I wanted to build a company that aligned with that. You know, yep. Because if you've got your purpose aligned, it doesn't feel like work, it's, it's happy you enjoy what you do, and you've got the experience you graded it so that comes with confidence so yeah. that's when i decided to set up my own sales consulting practice it's actually really interesting i was actually at the family business association um, conference yesterday and one of the family business owners very large family business both across australia and new zealand made the point that you know your children shouldn't necessarily work in the business and why i think this is relevant is because he said that if it's not their passion if it's not what they love if it's not what they want to do they're not going to add value to the business and i think that happens with all of us we actually have to question um, you know what is our purpose what do we love what do we we want to do and ensure that we are aligned with that because that's when you get the most value whether it's for your own business or working for somebody else couldn't agree more yeah and, and for me at the time i was you know chasing the dollar chasing the the role, the title, yep. the, you know, the hierarchy. And I realized that wasn't important to me anymore. Yeah. It's funny how we get to that, isn't it, at a certain <laughs> age? Right. I remember back in the early days of my career, you know, having the title, having the the car, having whatever kind of car it was, was really important. What yep. your title was, was important. What level of frequent flyer status you were at, all that stuff was important. And these days, I really couldn't give a toss about it. <laughs> well, that's right. And it's yep. been the most leveling experience for me because in a senior role, people want you mm. they want to make contact with you they want to do business with you yeah you feel important and it's very you, you have the power whereas here i am on my own yep trying to do exactly what they're trying to do which is get appointments build business <laughs> Establish credibility, brand, all that sort of thing. So yep. it's a very humbling <laughs> experience for me. You've got to watch what, what was the terminology you use? You've got to um, drink your own champagne. Champagne. <laughs> <laughs> Although it feels like medicine at the time, doesn't exactly, it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's probably been the biggest learning for me, actually, is yep. having to carry the bag again, as I call it, which is actually sell myself as opposed mm. to leading teams who sell. Okay. And so it's been um, quite a challenge, actually. You know, actually getting out there, working through the formula for success. Yep. You know, how do I go about things? How do I do things? And I'm lucky enough to partner up with Sandler Sales Training, mm -hmm. and they have a very well established what they call a gate selling process. So I've gone through all the sales training with them. Yep. And know how to sell their services in the way that they've refined over the years and years. In fact, they've been around 60 years. So I've been able to sort of get support and hone my own sales process down to make sure it's as effective as possible, which has been really helpful. Yeah. yeah. So obviously, yeah, that's a big switch going from leading a whole team of people who who do a lot of the work for you um, to actually going back into your own business. What do you think the biggest challenge has been? Oh, there's two for me. Yeah. One's mindset. Okay. I think it's really important. And a lot of the, the businesses I deal with and individuals as well, it's probably the thing that holds us back the most. You know, it's self-limiting beliefs. It's the head trash, as we call it. It's all the stuff going around in your head. Yep. So when you've got a list of people you need to call, you're you're, you're looking for any excuse not to call them. <laughs> <laughs> I was just sitting here giggling to myself because I, I actually, um, it's not just the not calling them, but then you kind of fall into this whole, I'm no good at selling. I don't like selling. And I, and I find myself doing that regularly. And then you have to say, actually, um, you've got to reposition that because if you keep saying that, you just actually create that reality, don't you? 
hundred percent. Yeah. And it, it's about these self-limiting beliefs. And the more you tell yourself that, the more you believe them. Mm-hmm. And when you pick up the phone and make the call, guess what? You're not going to do a great job. Are you? No, no, that's right. <laughs> yeah. I don't wa- believe in myself. Be How can you possibly believe no. in me? That's right. Yeah. yeah. Be waiting for the no or give them a reason to hang up on you. So you've got to have the confidence. And, and the one thing I've learned is that it's about the behaviors. You know, it's, if, if we, if we go about these cold calls and we know we've got to do them, mm-hmm. then the behavior drives the attitude. A right. lot of people think you've got to get the head right, got to get the head right before you do these things, but actually booking time in your diary, I'm going to make my calls on a Monday morning from 10 to 12, because yep. that's when I'm freshest. And that's when I'm going to have the most chance and I'm going to book it in and I'm going to make the calls yep. and I'm going to hold myself accountable to them. Yeah. That's okay. probably the biggest lesson I think for businesses. And, and one thing I've learned is you've just, you've got to do it and you've got to set up a process to do that. Yes. And the second thing is accountability. Right. Which yep. is, which is the, the tail end of that, which is how do I hold myself to account mm-hmm. in a business? You know, you've got bosses, you've got shareholders, you've got, boards you've got someone else to be accountable to yep. and you've got your own reputation which drives you mm-hmm. when you're a one-man band or even a small company mm-hmm. you've got no one checking in on you yeah so you know w- what we often do um, at sandler and i do with my clients is saying what are all the things that stand in the way of your success and you'll go through and say what, what gets in the way of your average day like, i get phone calls from mm-hmm. people great you know i go make a coffee i had a look at the internet i look at instagram <laughs> and if you calculate all the minutes adding up to hours of things that are unproductive time yeah there's a lot of waste to try it for sure it's yep what i do is i book time in my diary on a friday afternoon yep and i plan my next week i Mm -hmm. put the times in my diary for things that i need to do making calls following up and i plan my week to be as productive as possible yep and then i review that i review the previous week and go what did i achieve Mm -hmm. what didn't i achieve and why yeah what's working what's not working i think also and um we we talk about it with the bigger businesses we work with having a scorecard to actually measure things Mm -hmm. i think you still need that even as a one or a two-man band because again it gives you some accountability you can't keep looking at a scorecard every single week and the numbers being read and not be forced to do something about it whereas if you're not actually writing it down if you're not looking at it on a regular basis then it's very easy to kind of go oh yeah i did do it but i'll get around to it next week or you know procrastination is a, is a killer yeah, that's right and what i've done personally because this is what i need everyone might be slightly different in terms of accountability and driving their behavior mm-hmm. is i have a call with somebody every friday for yep. half an hour yeah and we say great you know, i'm asked hey simon what are you going to do next week what 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 have you committed to doing and i'll go well i'm doing xyz mm-hmm. and they'll do the same to me and i know that i've got that call on a friday accountability coach. yeah yeah <laughs> and so they'll find that really effective yeah i yeah. actually did it with one of my eos colleagues over in sydney and we just um used to text each other on a friday mm. and it was literally you know so we had agreed to do a certain number of what we call vth calls which is our sales course and we'd actually ask each other how had we gone had we achieved our target or not and even just knowing that that text message was going to come through and that you had to answer it um gave you that momentum to yeah. kind of keep things going so it's important yeah accountability is important and i always liken it to um it's like having a personal trainer right at the gym for many many years i paid for gym memberships and would never go Mm. because there was always a reason not to as soon as i started paying somebody to actually hold me accountable i now go three times a week they're expecting me i've paid for it guess what i I very very rarely ever miss a pt session absolutely and i think forming those habits probably over time you may not need the personal trainer anymore so i think it's getting to a point where it's sustainable i might but yeah (laughs) (laughs) i'm a little bit a little bit unique in that respect (laughs) okay great um so yes so having to go back to those basics and and doing some of the stuff that you're actually helping other people to do it really is an eye opener isn't it because i know when i I first started my business which is what 20 odd years ago now um yes i'd always been in other people's businesses always running large teams had lots of people to do stuff for me too and all of a sudden it's like oh I'm on my own. I have to do this all myself or I have to find other people to do it and, and working out, you know, who you employ, when you employ them, what they're going to do all becomes part of that forming a business. No, exactly. I mean, there's a couple of things on that. Firstly, we like to put together for our clients what we call a cookbook. Oh, yeah. Um, which is um, they take you through a process of saying, well, what's your goal? And it could be a revenue goal, let's say 100,000. Mm-hmm. And you say, well, what do I need to do to, to reach that in terms of the number of opportunities in the pipeline based on my conversions all the way through to how many conversations do I need to, or even how many dials do I need to make to get through to someone to have the conversation to have the meeting Mm -hmm. so it's a really sort of scientific way of going this is my activity plan this is what I need to do to be successful yep and the other thing which is really eye-opening for everyone when I take them through this is I we look at the the working hours in a year Yep. So if you think about working days, less you know, public holidays, actual day, holidays, yeah, plus leave, plus mm-hmm. sick days, plus whatever else you need to do in your life. Yep. And how, what, how many hours that, or how many days that translates to? 
it's quite a few, it's, yeah, it's, it's very quite scary. Yeah, yeah. So you think, wow, I've got to earn that much money in that length of time, mm. and all of a sudden there's this there's this compelling reason to, to work pressure. harder. Yep. And and what I do that sums myself, it equals four days a week. Yep. So you've got you know twenty percent of your week is ineffective potentially you don't have to, to to make the calls to generate the opportunities to close the business mm -hmm. it's like I, I need to cram in a four-day week into a five-day week yep yeah i know that's cool mm -hmm. and it's interesting too obviously we were established businesses and even businesses have been around for a long long time often haven't got that cookbook or that mm -hmm. recipe yep. sorted and, and it's one of the things we talk about is like you know do you know i mean i've got a very simple funnel um with the with the consulting business in terms of i know that if i send out 10 traction books to target market mm -hmm. audiences i get four f initial phone calls i can then have a conversation with about whether there's some value there for them two of those will book into a more comprehensive um sort of meeting around what the tools are and then one will become a client so that's pretty simple maths once you know that you can go right if i want one client per month what do i have to do the leading indicator is 10 books going out to target market audience yep. and you know if you don't do that you're never going to get to the one client so uh, but it's amazing how many businesses haven't actually worked through that there uh, i remember when i first came to new zealand i worked for an, an engineering firm and all the sales reps out on the road were were going out visiting people day in day out and i said so what was the purpose of the call what did you need to get from that what does your funnel look like like, how are you making sure you get the results? And they just didn't have it. They were just literally wandering around, almost having chats to people. How was the, how's the rugby? How's the weather? You know, yeah. but they didn't have that purpose in mind. Once you get that kind of level of clarity, it becomes easier, I would say. Well, not easy, but easier. A absolutely. And, and I, I call this a, a playbook. Mm -hmm. You know, you think about a recipe. So you go to a restaurant and yep. you have a lovely meal and you think, I'll oh, go home and try to recreate that. <laughs> and no matter what you do, you know, it may... It may taste okay, but it's not the same. Yep. You know, it's not a mouth-watering success. You're like, well, how do they do that? And if you think about sales, it's the same. If everyone, every salesperson goes into their sales process with a different formula, yep. there's going to be a huge amount of variability. Mm -hmm. So you might have one, but you, you extrapolate that out to teams and then multiple teams. There's, you know, it's, it's, it's obvious why teams is overperformers and underperformers, right? So to create that playbook, to create the whole sales stage, right from how we generate leads to how we get meetings to to what we do in the meeting, what the objectives are, how we handle that all the way through mm -hmm. is essential. So what we're saying is have a recipe for success, a yep. playbook. That doesn't mean people become robots. <laughs> it means they apply their own skills and abilities to that process to become successful. Mm -hmm. But it narrows down the variability and creates that recipe for success. So what I always say to to, um, to businesses and individuals is if you have a playbook and someone comes into your organization, organization could they learn that quickly repeat it and get up to speed really quickly and become effective yeah a lot of businesses go hey we've hired you they might go through a rudimentary sales interview process yep. here's your phone here's your laptop off you go here's off your you yellow go. pages <laughs> yeah, not quite but yeah a couple yeah. of hours with someone or you know ride shotgun with other salespeople. but that's just not enough yeah and so the learning curve um, is is much longer um, and steeper rather than the, sort of that intensive, right? We're going to put you through this induction program. We're going to get you up to speed. We're going to make sure you're at the right level and we follow this process and we've got the KPIs to track you along the way. Yeah. So that's that's um, an area I think that businesses could do a lot better in. Yeah. I think I mean, if you think about the EOS model, it's one of our core um, components. We've got six key components. One is process. Mm. And we say it's your core processes. It's not yeah. every single process. And like you said, we don't want to create robots. Mm. So it's not actually step by step by step down to the minute detail, but it is the core process. It's the key of that core process process what are the main steps you have to take what does that look like um, and then that gives the people the chance to to know what needs to be done but they still have the opportunity to humanize that potential so they can still put bring their own flavor to it but they've got that recipe to follow um, and, I, and I think one of my I, I loved one of my clients the other day said to me it's a little bit like you know when you're following a recipe to create a pavlova right I, I don't bake particularly well but if you follow the recipe for pavlova it's quite specific you've mm. got ingredients certain way of doing things a certain way of whisking it and then you put it in the oven and rah rah and if you change any of those things on the recipe um you will get something but it's probably not going to be a pavlova <laughs> <laughs> and i thought that is so true of business right it's like it's the recipe now it means that you can obviously add extra things to it you can add some some strawberries and some blueberries and things at the end to make it your own and make it quite you know quite unique however you've got to follow that core recipe to get that core pavlova that you can then work with yeah that's right and there's a really common trend i think it's in new zealand more than i've seen globally but um, the view of management is I hire expensive salespeople, they should know how to do their job. Mm. And they might in certain environments in the way that they've been trained. 
which is distinctly different depending on where you've come from, what you do. I've yeah. come from a very formalized training background. I've been through probably three or four major sales methodologies, <laughs> you know, and I'm analytical. Yeah. So, but where some people are, they'll shoot from the hip and they're really good. They've got the gift of the gab. They, they know how to deal with people. They can read them really well, but those aren't necessarily replicable. Yeah. And so, um, by creating that playbook, it says, great, here's the way we do things. It's kind mm. of like McDonald's. Yeah. Here's the rule book. This, we know this is really successful. Yep. But by the way, if you can do it better, feedback into the process, we mm. can improve that or you've got a different way. Yep. If you're meeting your numbers and they're meeting theirs in a different way, that's fine. But here's what we think is, is the best way to go about that. And like you said, that will even out some of those, you know, real high performers and real mm. underperformers. But I suppose it also gives a chance because if you've got all that in place and somebody's still not performing, so you've got that plus your, your scorecard KPIs and they're still not performing, then it gives you an opportunity to to deal with that in whatever is the best way, right? Yeah, absolutely. So you've got a few different things. You've got the capability of the salesperson. Yep. So before you hire them, you should be really understanding what capability you need, depending on your product industry, the role, you know, how unique the sales process is. You know, it mm -hmm. could be a a long sales process selling software that could be you need someone who's a real strategic salesperson solution salesperson versus someone who's a commodity salesperson someone where exa demand exists might be um, selling food products into a supermarket for example yep um, so you've got to understand what you're looking for and give them the training relevant to what they're doing and make sure that's standardized yep um, and bring everyone up to the same kind of capability level and that's the ability to, to apply that to your sales process to be successful mm -hmm. yeah so you've got unlocking the potential of the, the individuals yeah and then you've got how that translate to having the right systems and processes in the background to enable those salespeople to be effective you know um, some research recently from HubSpot said that salespeople only spend around 30 percent of their time selling and oh. the rest of the time is internal stuff. It's yep. admin, it's you know, ineffective CRMs if they've got one. There's a, <laughs> there's a whole lot of stuff in the background that's keeping them from having either finding customers, yep. developing opportunities, closing deals. Yeah. Actually, that's a really interesting point. I know when I first came to New Zealand many, many, many years ago, uh, one of my first roles was sales and marketing for the engineering firm. And I had come from the pharmaceutical industry. So even in my very, very early days when laptops were really only just kind of coming out and we had dial up internet, we actually had a CRM system that was really powerful. Mm. And I loved it as a salesperson. I loved it because it actually enabled me to to plan my day properly, do all the right things, did all the follow up for me. It was really, really great. Mm. And so I've always been used to, to working in that environment. I came over here, started working with this engineer firm and I said to them you know how do you keep track of what you've just said in that meeting with that client and they're like oh what do you mean I said well where do you keep track of all this information well I don't how do you know what you're going to do when you wake up in the morning how do you know what you know what your plan is and they really had no systems and I've what I've learned is that a lot of people think that CRM is actually a, a, a disabler is that the right word it's yep. like yeah um for sales people but if it's used correctly it can be really powerful I think is that what uh, you yeah, think absolutely. too yeah um, admin's the most common word for it I have to fill in all this admin but actually yeah. when you unlock um the capability of a good CRM you know all your emails should be synchronized mm -hmm. so where you send an email yep. from your email that's sh from your um outlook for example yeah that should be tracked within the CRM mm -hmm. and so every piece of correspondence is tracked and you know, I, I follow the adage, you can't manage what you can't measure. Yeah. And if you don't know activity, for example, how many calls are we making? How successful are those calls? If you can't track any of that, you can't work out the variability and therefore improve things. Mm. So um, there's a real shift to making sure we've got everything tracked in a centralized way, which tends to be the CRM. Yep. So you've got all emails, all correspondences, all opportunities. You've got your KPIs in there. Your so tasks, your next so things there's, to do there's, next. There's yep. no hiding. And yep. in my experience, it's a cultural issue. If you've got a company who's done things the same way without that level of accountability moving there is a real challenge mm -hmm. because they know that there's nowhere to hide right yeah you know where you are you know how many calls you've made you know how successful those calls are moving to meetings blah 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 yeah so but it gives you such insight right i mean it's, oh, the data huge. can be data can be really helpful and really um, yep. not helpful but if you actually have the right data and you're looking at it you can start to see like my very simple funnel you can start to see if you're sending out 10 books and, and the, the, the 10 4 2 1 if any of those variables start to change you have to go okay so what's happening and what do i need to do to address that um, because that means something is going wrong somewhere um, yep. and that's what data gives you I think yeah I mean, yeah. An example of that the client who I worked with um, either last year they installed a new CRM and we worked out some KPIs and we started getting them to track all their information mm -hmm. and we worked out that one salesperson had a 5% conversion rate from having a lead to arranging a meeting which was the next part of their sales process uh, the next person was 35%. I was going to say 5% is really low. Yeah. Really low. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so when it, when that when that comes up every week in the sales meetings, go, oh, you know, how's how's that going and what how is that working out for you? And we'll go, 
you have this person, how do you do it? And we'll say, well, actually unpack it. Yep. You know, what, how do you make the call? Who are you trying to get hold of? Um, what's your call script? How do you deal with objections? You know, what are you actually going into that meeting trying to achieve? Whereas yep. this other person was doing everything wrong. Mm, yep. <laughs> and so I would say, great, we can bring you up to speed. Here's an example of that. We can get you on a call. There's it. So it's, it helps with the training consistency about it. Mm. And there's, and there's of, an opportunity, right? I think yeah. people think that you're being monitored by Big Brother, but in actual fact, if you're using it well, it gives you an opportunity to see where you can improve, learn new things. Um, but also, like I said, with, with me, it, it meant that I could actually much better organize my day, my week, um, I knew what I was doing and that, that made my whole sales job a whole lot easier, yeah. less admin. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think getting people to use a CRM is a sale in itself. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, you know, again, it's, especially with entrenched views about some salespeople just want to be left alone and anything you do is micromanagement. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but there's a lot of benefits of using it that can really help them, as you say, manage tasks and manage what they do in an easy way. Yeah, you can't lose track of things when it's in a CRM. When yeah. it says the next action for this client is this and it reminds you on the day, it's like, yeah. oh yeah, that's right, I've got to call that person. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we're at that stage at the moment within New Zealand and as people are starting to move towards uh, high quality CRM systems that yep. fully integrate, but that's a big job. Mm. You know, if you make it work properly, because there's there's gates in there, there's workflow. Yep. You get to this point, need to send that off for a quote or approval. So there's, there's quite often a lot of work to do in the background to get it working effectively. And I think that's probably the challenge, isn't it? I think a lot of people have gone and gone, um, okay, we'll get a CRM and they pick one off the shelf, they just pop it in there, and they haven't yep. thought about what mm. is actually what they wanted to use it for and how do they use it the best advantage. So in my opinion, now, in order to install a CRM effectively, is to actually think about about your entire process yep. think about how it's going to support you through that and then start to build it around that that playbook that yeah, you said and yeah. there's some 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 real um challenges with that a lot of people just sign up to the cheaper crm or yeah. one that meets the needs now and the pricing model will go from here stepping up to something ridiculously yeah. expensive so they sort of suck you into getting the basic functionality in some cases is really good mm. but you haven't considered marketing what are you doing with lead gen yeah how does that fit in how do we track leads how do we lead score mm -hmm. how do we develop quotes how do we send those quotes out and get you know you can have those docu signed and put back into the crm yeah, there's yeah. so much technology you can have um, that integrates does it have an app what happens what's that user experience when my when my reps out in front of the customer do we want to have pricing and everything linking back to the crm so it, it's sort of looking at i've done this recently it's looking at the world of opportunity mm. and narrowing that back down to reality you know yep. what's really effective and making sure there's an roi not yeah. just it's nice to have but this is an essential part of what we do because it adds value to our customers to our team and it's you know affordable yeah mm. and sometimes you know that our whole roi because I, I i i have i think i encounter this a lot where people say oh but this is going to cost x amount of money and you go yeah but what time will it save you mm. and if you put a value on your time what you'll find is that sometimes what looks like a significant cost can actually end up being a cost saving. So it is really important to look at the whole picture and go, well, what real value does this add? Not a nice to have, but if it adds real value and takes away time from you, you know, what do you value your hourly rate at? And so if this can take even an hour away of your week every week, then what does that, you know, look like in terms of a saving for the company? I think that's where people often don't think about. Well, that's um, a great point. I, I see that with small businesses in particular, because yep. it's all about cost, cost, cost. Yes. And people don't look at, you know, what that return could be. Mm -hmm. And back to that cookbook, actually, if you if you define it down, it works out what your hourly rate is. <laughs> Does it? <Okay. laughs> you go, right, <laughs> yeah. I'm worth $200 an hour. Yep. You know, that, that Instagram post I've just read, that's five minutes <laughs> out of my day or half an <laughs> yeah. hour. I've just cost myself an opportunity cost yes. that much money. So I think that's back to the accountability. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, just trying to get, um, especially small business owners, is to see that value yep. and rather seeing it a cost to see it as an investment and what you can get back on it. Yeah, fantastic. Mm. And so for larger companies, there's also that I think I've seen this when I've worked in corporates, right? There is also that thing to go out and buy the biggest bells and whistles, everything there, mm. and then they don't use it too. Yep. So that you can go either way, can't you? You can actually go out and buy. I remember um, I've gone through many Salesforce implementations and also HubSpot as well. Mm. And it's like they buy because it's got all the bells and whistles, but then we're not using even a fraction of what they can actually do. So you need to be careful that you actually have fit for purpose, I suppose is the word I would use. Yes, that's right. Yep. I mean, we know IT failures, it's not, not down to the usability, of it. it's down to uptake. Yeah. <laughs> and it's no difference with CRM. So yeah. one thing getting it installed, you've got to create the momentum for change. You know, mm. it is a change project. You've got to get people on board, but it needs the sales leaders, the management to make sure that compliance is there, yep. that it's used, you know, that, that people are being followed up on things that need to be followed up on. And once people get used to it, it tends to gain momentum. But if you just install it, leave it, chances are it 
yeah, it could be a failure. Yeah. yeah. I think you made a really good point earlier on about, you know, when you bring people on board, it is your responsibility as a leader to actually give them the right training mm. to manage them. And what I, um, we talk about delegate. Eleg- ah, my mouth is not working today. <laughs> Been too, traveling too much. Delegate and elevate, which yep. is where you're looking at, you know, what do you need to get rid of so you can elevate yourself to the highest thing? Mm. And some people sort of think that delegate means that you can just abdicate because yes. abdicate is like, I don't want to do that. Hey, mm-hmm. here, you go ahead and do that and just, just get on with it. Whereas when you really try truly delegate you're actually you know you're working at exactly what it is that you want what the outcomes are that you want from that um you're going to be helping them with the training you're going to spend time with them to make sure they understand what needs to be done so how do you help with that yeah i mean the, uh, when it comes to hiring what i really respect about people i'm interviewing is them asking about that what support will i get when i when i when i get on mm. uh, what i promote with my clients is having a really robust onboarding process yep and so it'll be three to six months depending on the client but it will be very robust so it'll be you know detailed about who they who they're teaming up with it'll be internal meetings it'll be understanding the proposition it'll be the basics for month mm. one and month two it'll be getting down to the detail right what's our elevator pitch what's yours put in your own language yeah um, you're going to be shadowing someone you're going to be making calls you're going to be going along to meetings and it all it all builds to i'm starting to build and develop the pipeline because what tends to happen in a lot of companies is they leave everyone up to their own devices and then three to six months later they're looking at the sales results going We've paid all this money and we've got no results. We've got a a problem here. And the gap between where they are and where they need to be is so wide, a lot of those people just end up failing. They Mm. leave or, you know, they get performance managed out. So making sure that there's a robust plan that's progressive with KPIs along the way is really, really important. You know, at this point, we think in your role, you should have a pipeline of X and you should be closing Y. Yep. And within six months, we expect you to be delivering this number based on the training and support we're giving along the way. Mm-hmm. And there's accountability to the sales leaders for, for not helping them with that. Yeah. And, and if, they, if they're not performing, it's a matter of what do we need to do to help. Mm-hmm. And then if it comes a point at which you know that there's a performance management issue, then that's then another area that yeah. potentially. I always say that when we have a thing called a people analyzer and a people analyzer is all about, you know, identifying those areas where there are weaknesses. Mm-hmm. And our role as leaders is to absolutely help that person to get back up to being what we would call a plus, a plus on that people analyzer. Yeah. Um, and that's our first, you know, that's our first thing as leaders. We're there to actually help them get there. If after you've given them all the help, all the training, all the support, then they're not achieving it, then it's time to actually do some performance management. But we've got to take that first step. And I think I see it with a lot of people that I work with they said they bring on a salesperson and they go we've invested all this money we're paying all this money for this person they're not doing what they want and you have to actually ask the question how have you supported them to get there so what you're suggesting is that you actually help them to put together a plan for that first three to six months they know exactly what the sort of kpis that they have to achieve and where they would ex- a benchmark of where they would expect to be um yeah, in the organization yeah and again back to that sort of cultural norm we have about high rangers leaving them to it yep a lot of sales leaders that i see don't feel they've either earned the right or it's their role to coach okay and that is the most important thing you can do as a sales leader yeah and to do that you need to be present you need to be alongside them you need to be evaluating you need to be showing them and and guiding them towards what they need to be doing Mm -hmm. and so what often happens is salespeople after month two three when they're not being successful they start to feel stress and they behave in certain ways yeah and that could be hiding it could be you know it could be a number of things that are unhealthy. Mm-hmm. And so, but but every month where you're guiding them, you're making sure you're benchmarking them against those KPIs and you help supporting them to get to where they need to be, then that reduces that tendency a heck of a lot. Mm. But it really is the role of a leader to ensure the salespeople are where they need to be. Um, rather than sort of, as you said before, abdicating responsibility. <laughs> yeah, 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 I've been guilty of that myself, sadly. <laughs> okay, so we've talked a lot about, you know, the, yeah, the sales um, process or the cookbook playbook, we mm. want to call it. We've talked about making sure we actually support people when we bring them on board and that we're actually coaching them and leading them to success as opposed to just leaving them to, to, to what's it, sink or swim. Yep. Um, what would be the kind of, the, so if somebody's listening to this and they're going, hey, how do I even get started? You know, I know that maybe my sales team isn't performing as well as it should do, or we've suddenly had, particularly in New Zealand at the moment, a bit of a slowing off because of what's going on what what would be the first steps they would take how what are the three kind of top tips or things you could advocate for yeah i think um people can do well by looking at their sales process no one likes the word process yeah but ultimately we're talking about everything from generating leads how do i find the prospective customers Mm -hmm. all the way through to close let's analyze it and i guarantee if you sat down with a team of five and asked them what their sales process is individually they will have a different idea (laughs) yes (laughs) so it's you know what what do you do today and and analyzing each step that they take and and working out what would work really well Mm -hmm. and it's when you chunk things down make them simple that you 
um, you start to realize where the opportunities for improvement are. Yep. So an example of that, a small business I'm dealing with at the moment had a 30% close rate, which actually sounds pretty good. Yep. But when we went through the way he sold, you know, from generating leads through how does he convert that lead to a, a conversation, mm -hmm. a conversation to a meeting, you know, is he dealing with the right people? Is it the decision maker? Yep. Um, do they have the authority to buy? Do they have a budget? You know, <laughs> often budgets left till right at the end to talk yes. about. Um, how, how does the when does the proposal happen? A lot of people give a proposal right up front, yeah. and they wonder why they get ghosted. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's that classic. I'm busy. Call me back. Never, never happens, right? So what we're able to do is actually just work through each of those stages, call it the gate selling, and say what needs to happen there. What's an optimal process? What are the outcomes you're looking for? You know, when it comes to questioning, how do we question properly? Mm -hmm. you know, deep questions, surface pain. You know, what's going on in the business? What it means financially and commercially, but what it means to that individual. Yep. So once we really understand that, we know the questions, we know the process, we can build a picture of what's going on and build that ROI model, build the budget step and make sure we understand that they've got the right amount of money and that we're talking the right language before we move into decision making mm -hmm. process. So what I find is a lot of small businesses in particular, they will spend a lot of time with a prospect loosely, someone mm -hmm. who's inquiring. Um, and they will start talking. They will talk for a length of time, trying to demonstrate credibility yep. in the process, giving a lot of free information away. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think about every 10 inquiries, you probably only got one or two that are genuinely interested. The rest of them are, you know, they're tire kicking, they're looking for pricing options to make sure they're competitive. Yep. So uh, small businesses don't have the time to do all this. So when they, when they look at that sale process and asking the right questions up front, you know, someone did this to me when I was building my website. They, yep. they first question they asked is, "What's your budget?" Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they said, "We don't deal with any clients under thirty thousand dollars." Right. And they're like, "Well, it's not me." And <laughs> yeah. so that quickly closes it so off. So actually, but, getting to know early is yeah, is, is yeah. actually really good, I think, isn't it? Qualifying the ones out that are never going to buy. You know, yeah. Are you generally interested in buying, or are you inquiring? Mm -hmm. um, are you a competitor? You know. So it actually looking at that sales process really importantly and refining that to make sure all the tough questions that no one likes talking about money mm -hmm. when you've got to ask the question what were you thinking in terms of price what sort of budgets you, in fact you don't even use that word but you know what sort of money would you have to spend what's yep. your you know what are you thinking in terms of how much this is worth to you mm -hmm. and once you, you can qualify those people out really quickly and only deal with the ones that are likely to buy yeah. yeah and you gave me a really nice tip before we came into the podcast you know sometimes it's actually okay to give them an out as well mm. because i think particularly in new zealand it's been my experience i work between new zealand and australia they're very very different personalities aussies are pretty much up front what you get you know what they say is what mm. you get and so they're quite happy to say no nope, not interested that's fine whereas i find kiwis and british people like myself are very uh, much more wanting to keep everybody happy and so they'll quite happily you know say yes when deep down they're not they're not really thinking yes so actually being able to give them an opportunity to say hey look it's okay to say no and I'd much rather know that than, than you know, get into the um, the tangle of months and months of communication, non-communication, ghosting, all the things that go on to get to a no. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I work on this principle, if you feel it, say it. You know, if it feels like they're palming you off yep. or creating a, a, it's creating a reason not to do business, then just say, quite often with clients or people I talk to, they often say, hey, let's talk again later. But what they really mean is <laughs> they're not interested. Yep. You know? And that's okay. You know, yeah. is that the case here? Yeah. Oh yeah, gosh, you got me off. You know, <laughs> <laughs> thanks. You've given me an out here. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And it's it means hey, you haven't wasted a whole lot of your time and energy, and probably hope that this opportunity may arise, and yes. it probably helps them out as well. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Okay, so process is one of the most important things. What are the other two things that they should look at? <laughs> um, I think really understanding the capability of, of the team, the required capability. A lot of people um, probably don't spend enough time looking at the actual skills required within the role because mm -hmm. every sales role is different. You know, so they'll they'll hire on the other companies they work for or generalized skills, but really being specific at the hiring stage about the type or the persona of salesperson that you're looking for is really, really important because once they're in, and as we said before, it's very hard to get them out again. Yeah. So making sure we've got the right skills and capability. Mm. And then they meet the values of the company as well, yep. of course. So yep. they're actually part of the actual family. Okay, yep. cool. Last but certainly not least, in fact, this is a number one thing is making sure you've got the culture right. Okay. You know. Culture is really about how things look around here. What's the level of accountability? How high performing is the team? Yep. You know, what do we really need to do? You could have all the great skills and capabilities in the world, but if they're not activated, happy and engaged, then mm -hmm. your results are going to be lackluster. So yep. it was almost actually designing that, you know, using your team to help with that. What are some words you'd use to describe our team or you yep. aspirationally how we want our team to be? Mm -hmm. You want it to be fun, hardworking, accountable. What does accountable mean? Yeah. Well, don't let us off the hook. You know? <laughs> yeah. That yep. means if we do something, we, we if say we're going to do something, we're going we to do, do it. it and if we don't yep. do it, there might be consequences. Mm -hmm. You know, so really define in your organization 
what that culture should be, what you want it to be, how it aligns with your values and create that rather than let it happen organically. Yeah. We've all worked, worked in teams or I've worked in some, it's just amazing. It's magic. Yeah. You know, it works really well, but it's not designed that way. It's just a whole bunch of people colliding, coming together, <laughs> to create that. Yeah. And you change a person, you bring someone else in, the culture changes. You bring a new leader in, the culture changes. So it's, you know, having a well-architected culture that drives high performance. Yeah, oh, fantastic. Mm. Okay, so you work with um, businesses of all shapes and sizes, don't you? What's kind of your ideal client look like? Yes, um, I'm spending a lot of time in the small to medium space at the moment. Yep. Um, we definitely, through through Sandler, we can, we can deal with small, medium, and large because yep. sales, you know, B2B type sales can apply to any industry. Mm -hmm. And so we can apply the methodology and framework in, in the uniqueness that they pick the clients have. So we'll look at their unique business and their market and apply the same framework to their organization. Yep. So right, right across the board and, and any vertical either. So it's right across the board. Okay, perfect. Mm. And if they want to get in contact with you, what's the best way to get hold of you? Probably take a look at my website. Yep. Uh, ElevateSales.co.nz. Okay, ElevateSales.co.nz. Yep. Okay. Perfect. We'll make sure that's in the um, the you. link down below as well. And um, I've got an interesting question for me personally anyway, this whole commission only salesperson <laughs> thing. Because <laughs> I know that and particularly in that small, medium sized business, they, people are going to go, oh, I don't want to pay a huge salary for a salesperson. Um, and I've even heard of people who want to cap commission. And that, that does my head in because I kind of go, why would you cap commission? Um, at the end of the day, if they're bringing in more sales for you, then and as long as it's profitable, then it makes sense to continue to pay them the commission. Mm. But some people believe that you know commission only sales is the way to go because that way, if they don't work, we don't pay for them. What's your view on that? Oh my gosh, I've worked with designed and been involved in commission plans uh, for years and years, yeah. <laughs> and you have professors that design them. Right? Oh really? <laughs> well, it's, it's based on human behaviour. Yeah, yeah. But no two commission plans are the same. Is the first point right? Um, so you're looking at a broad spectrum of commission only through to zero commission. Last mm -hmm. company I worked for took away commissions oh wow banks have taken away commissions recently so there's definitely a move towards um commissions a dirty word right um, but essentially you need to look at the the strategy and what the, what you're trying to drive what are the objectives you're trying to drive and and how do you how do you model the behavior in other words how much base salary do you have versus the is the, the at, at risk, risk component yep yep and yes there are some roles you know when you're selling a one-off thing it's a churn and burn like if you've got a churn and burn product you're selling a, a widget you yep. need to call that people need to call sign up and move on Commission only is fantastic. Right. Where you've got a more strategic sale that's longer, yep. you want a more customer intimate relationship where they're invested in the client and the outcome on a long-term basis. You don't want that yep. because you're going to get someone who's going to just destroy everything. Yes. <laughs> they're going to do whatever they can, stamp on whoever they like. I mean, I'm exaggerating here, but yeah, stamp yeah, on whoever yeah. they like. Probably bad for culture in the organization as well. That's, sure. where, that's where salespeople get a bad rep. Mm -hmm. So you've got to look at where you are on that continuum and what's going to work best for you and the customer. Mm, that makes perfect sense. And then the very last question is around um, hunter versus gatherer. You know, the, the whole, um, <laughs> can you get both in one person or are they quite distinct? Absolutely. A lot of people talk about them being separate. Yep. I like to talk about hunting with a shotgun. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, farming with a shotgun. Oh, yeah, okay, right. Yeah. So you, you're... you're great at nurturing accounts and yep. getting the best, but you also need to be looking for opportunities in those. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, I think you absolutely can get those skills. Yep. But it's a matter of, again, working out the capabilities you need. If you've got a large strategic account, um, you should have the ability to manage accounts and spend a lot of your time nurturing those and making sure that you know customer satisfactions are yeah. there and there's a partnership. But you also need to be looking for opportunities yeah, at the same the time hunting part as well. And hopefully, got the capabilities to retire those in mm -hmm. terms of process. Some bigger organisations will um, you will hand that across to somebody else, a business development. Particularly person. if if it's a very technical kind of business as well, it makes sense to have somebody who really is the technical expert mm. who can then actually nurture that relationship and, and farm it um, yes. moving forward. Mm. Um, but the hunter goes out and creates opportunities. So, Correct, yeah. but they can happen it can be in both okay that's really cool yeah. um awesome some really some real gold in there my mouth is not working well today but i appreciate <laughs> you sticking with me um and yeah thank you simon well, it's I'll, been a real pleasure yeah it's and it's safe want to get in contact with you this is elevatesales.co.nz right. um, and we can also find you on linkedin i guess under simon Carsters. Yep. yep perfect Brilliant. thank you for your time thanks, thanks thanks for listening to the podcast show better business better life my name is deborah chantry taylor i'm an eos implementer family business advisor business and leadership coach, podcaster, and speaker. However, I'm also a business owner with several current business interests. I'm fortunate to have lived the high life with all the lifestyle, the toys, you name it, and then I've lost it all, not only once, but twice in two spectacular train wrecks. I know what it's like to experience the highs and lows. I came across EOS when they launched into New Zealand using my Entrepreneur's Playground and Event Centre in Parnell, Auckland. 
I love the simplicity of the tools and their philosophies fitted my personal brand statement perfectly. The brilliance is in the simplicity. I've always been passionate about seeing entrepreneurs lead a life they love, and now I help them live that EOS life. Doing what they love, with people they love, making a huge difference in the world, being compensated appropriately, and with time to pursue other passions. If you want more information or want to get in contact about using EOS in your business, you can visit my website at debra.coach. That's www.debra.coach. Thanks for listening.